Hello, hello there, and welcome to my presentation on estate planning. I think we're calling it everything you need to know about estate planning before talking to a lawyer. If you don't know who I am, my name is Christopher Small. I'm the owner of CMS Law Firm. You probably have seen my face on some videos somewhere at some point in time, but today you're just going to see these slides because I'm teaching you something. Um, what, what we're talking about here, what we're doing is really this is kind of the my spiel that I give to uh, potential clients when they come into the office and, and want to learn about estate planning. And I figured I would just sort of, you know, condense it all and put it here so that you could get this information um, before you talk to me or before you talk to anybody. So you can kind of have that foundation um, of estate planning and uh, make some good decisions from, from, from this point moving forward. So let's just uh let's get right into it okay so first of all there's one thing i'm certain of we all need estate planning married or single kids or no kids money or no money the only difference between all of these groups is the type of estate planning you need and that's what we're going to talk about today I am going to tell you everything you need to know about estate planning before you talk to a lawyer. But first, I got to do something lawyery, okay? I got to let you know that this is not legal advice. And what you'll see as we go through is while this is extremely helpful information, it's going to give you a tremendous background on estate planning and the, and the uh, foundational elements of estate planning. And when you're done with this video, you may very well know exactly what you want to do when it comes to creating your own estate plan. It's important for me to point out that every family is different. Every family's goals and needs and wants are different. Every family's dynamics are different and every family's concerns are different. So please, please, please don't just run out and do something um, based only on this presentation. It's going to give you a, a lot of information, a lot of helpful information and you will leave this presentation uh, with a, a thorough understanding of estate planning. But this is one of those deals where you don't know what you don't know. Okay, so please, please, please don't run off and do something crazy. And then uh, just don't blame me for it in particular. All right. Now that we got that out of the way. So what the heck is estate planning anyway? It's a bunch of different stuff. First of all, it's personal protection, protecting yourself and protecting your assets, right? We're talking about while you're still alive, believe it or not. It's family protection. Again, protecting your people and protecting your assets as a family. It's asset allocation, right? Where are we moving our assets to? It's asset management and oversight. How are we making sure that the, the wealth that we have accrued over time is going to be used by our family for good and not for evil to pursue opportunity instead of be squandered that's what estate planning can help you with as we all already know it can help with tax reduction and avoidance this is both income tax and estate taxes all right okay great you're probably thinking just vague enough to not really mean anything at all but don't worry we're about to get in the weeds. We're going to dive in here a little bit and get into some more specifics. Actually, we're going to do it right now. So estate planning protection really covers you in two circumstances. Circumstance number one is if you are alive but incapacitated. Circumstance number two is when you die. Okay. And we might as well talk about this really quickly. I know a lot of people don't like to talk about death. You might be one of those people. I don't certainly don't like to talk about it all the time. But until there is a medical breakthrough, one thing is certain. We are all going to die. It's true. I don't know anyone yet that has, that has lived forever. So instead of avoiding it, instead of avoiding death, we might as well do a relatively simple things, a few relatively simple things to make sure our people and ourselves are taken care of all right now remember there are two 
sort of circumstances that estate planning covers. Circumstance number one is alive but incapacitated. And this usually falls under two sort of circumstances. Circumstance number one is with our teddy bear here, right? We are, we are injured in an accident and we are out of commission. So the classic example is you're in a car accident and you're in a coma. Incapacitated on the other side, as we get older, things like Alzheimer's, dementia, and even any other uh, sort of diseases that take our wits away from us. There are several different things that fall under this alive but incapacitated um, standpoint when it comes to estate planning. The first is the power of attorney. I think many of us have heard of a power of attorney before, but we may not know exactly what it does. Essentially, it gives the person that you name to be your agent the ability to do many different things for you. Most of them are surrounding uh, the ability to act on your behalf for financial matters. So we're talking about writing checks, we're talking about paying bills, we're talking about signing contracts, potentially, um, but essentially it's that day-to-day -day stuff that you do. This person can step into your shoes and do it for you, okay? The person that you appoint to this position has a fiduciary relationship, or, uh, a fiduciary duty to you, which means they are tasked with acting in your best interest. So the person that you name as your power of attorney is not allowed to take your money out of your bank account and go spend it for themselves, okay? Now, one of the questions I always get when I have this, um, um, when I have this discussion with, with potential clients is, who is right for this position? And I thought that I would just tell you, right? Typically, it's gonna be somebody that's honest, which makes sense, someone that is responsible. Typically, it's someone that knows your family, so they kind of understand how your family works, what you've got going on in your life, so that they can better uh, take care of those needs. It's someone that is willing to take on the role. And often, this person is the same uh, appointed person for each spouse. So if you're married, typically it's going to be the same backup for each spouse. And typically, by the way, when you're married, for almost all these positions, it's gonna be spouse is gonna be the first backup, and then you're gonna have another backup in case something happens to both of you, all right? Now, one of the things that I always point out and stress when I have these conversations with people is what happens if you don't pick? What happens if you don't have these documents in place? Because knowing the downside, knowing the consequences is important for two reasons. A, I hope it makes you take action, right? I hope it makes you do something. But B, if you don't take action, if you decide not to do anything, which is perfectly fine, I want you to do that and make that decision being fully informed. That's what this presentation is all about to give you the knowledge and the power to make informed decisions related to your family. Now, if you don't pick, guess who picks? A judge. And it's a long process, and it's an expensive process, and the judge is not going to pick a family member. It's gonna be a professional. You're gonna to have to pay them. They're not gonna know your family. It's not a fun process. And this can sneak up in ways that people don't realize sometimes, and it can really hurt. A perfect example is, that I got a call one time from a woman whose husband had just suffered a stroke, I think. He was unconscious, or at the very least just unable to act, and the way that they had set up their finances was um, all of the operating funds, all of the funds for the family, were in a bank account that were in the husband's name only. And the wife did not have a power of attorney. And when the husband had the stroke, the, the, the wife was all of a sudden literally cut off from accessing any of the bank funds. So to do that act, to get that access, she needed to do a, an emergency um, a guardianship motion, basically in front of the court, have someone else appointed to that position to be able to access that money. So it was a pretty sad situation and it all could have been avoided by simply creating this power of attorney, all right? The next document that covers you while you are alive but incapacitated is called a medical power of attorney. As you might expect, a medical power of attorney covers all of those things related to your medical needs, right? So we have the literal medical needs up on the top, and the other picture on the right is your sort of, not your figurative medical needs, but long-term care, 
So long-term care is also included here. So this person is responsible for making medical decisions on your behalf if you cannot make them and is responsible for setting up long-term care needs if you end up having to, to need them, okay? Now, who is right for this position? Again, this person knows you. They're willing to take on the role. They're usually a direct family member, parents, uh, siblings, uh, kids, you know, when they get old enough. And often this is not the same person for each spouse, unless it's gonna be a kid or something. Uh, because this is sort of a, a more of a family thing, people will typically choose a family member from their side of the family, all right? And if you don't pick, guess who picks? This is my universal sign for the government picks. And what this means is there are statutes in place that basically say if someone cannot make a medical decision and a medical decision is necessary, we are going to start with this person who, who has authority to make the decision. If they aren't around, we're going to go to this person, then this person, and then this person until we find a level that has someone that is willing to make a decision. Okay, again, not a place you want to be because you may have a sibling or a parent or someone that you don't want making medical decisions on your behalf, that you don't want to have access to your medical information. You may not want that. If you don't, having a medical power of attorney is a great way to ensure that the people that you want to take care of you are actually in place to take care of you. Okay, next document is called Health Care Directive. This, by the way, when it comes to talking about death and the, and the things that people don't like to discuss, this is the one. This is the biggest one, okay? Because there's no easy way to really des to describe this one, but it's the question of, do you want to pull the plug or not, right? You're in a vegetative state. I believe the, the language in the document is um, you are in a permanent unconscious um, position and applying life-sustaining treatment would only serve to prolong the process of your dying. So we're basically talking about machines are keeping you alive, they don't think you're coming back, do you want to pull the plug or not? This document doesn't name any person, it's, it just states your intention. And it does that for two reasons. First, it provides certainty for the person that makes the decision. And I've talked about this before on some of my other uh, videos that I've made, but I used to watch this show all the time called like Tyler medium the me, Tyler the medium or something is on as on don't hate my my viewing choices but I didn't and he used to go and like uh, do readings for people you know like uh, people would come back from the dead and the the part that I was always fascinated with as an estate planning attorney were the questions that the people that were alive wanted to know from Tyler and I can't tell you how many times one of the first things that that the people wanted to know was you know I had to make this decision, you know, pull the plug or not. Did I do the right thing? You know, they didn't have the guidance from their person and it literally follows them around forever. It's something that, that is a very difficult decision and if you don't have any direction on it, it can really sort of chase you for a long time. So, healthcare directive provides certainty for the person that makes the decision so they can know that they're doing the right thing. It also eliminates conflict over what you would have wanted to do from other family members. If you remember the Terry Scheibel case, this woman had a heart attack, and while her heart was stopped, she had a lack of oxygen to her brain. So they were able to keep her alive, but she ended up being uh, brain dead, essentially. They went to the husband and asked the husband what they should do. He said, pull the plug. Uh, the parents said, no, she definitely would not have wanted to pull the plug. And litigation ensued. It went all the way, I think, up to the Supreme Court, but I know it was very expensive. It was very hurtful to, to all the family members and it could have been avoided with this one little document. All right. Now, that is it for you if you are single, if you are married without kids, but if you have kids and they are under 20 or under 18, if they're minors, then there are two other documents that we usually throw into this foundational plan that I think are critically important, okay? The first one is called minor power of attorney. The second one is called minor medical power of attorney. And as you might guess, these things basically serve the function of temporary guardian designations, right? 
what does this mean exactly? Well, if you and your spouse are laid up in the hospital for three months after a car accident, who would enroll the kids in school? Who would sign field trip waivers? Who would take them to routine medical checkups, you know, like your yearly checkup? Who would just stand in for you when necessary in that parental role and provide that parental consent and do those things? That's what these documents do. They literally name the person that will stand in and, and fill in for these roles, right? Basically a temporary parent. And this is critically important because if you are in the hospital for months, someone needs to step in and take care of the kids. And if you don't pick, guess who picks? This is the one that always gets me because I have kids, right? If you don't know, I have a six, a four, and a two-year-old, three kids. The reason I got into estate planning was because of those kids. So this is the one that, that tearjerker for me, right? So this, this isn't exactly who picks, but first things first, there's a, there's a potential that the, the police could be the ones that come and get your kids when something happens to you. They could um, be put in the hands of a social worker, which is who that lady is in my mind. And then a judge is going to make a decision as to who the temporary guardian is. They could decide it is one of these social workers, somebody that's not a family member. Um, they are probably not going to put your kids in the hands of a friend um, if they don't know anything about your family. So this is very difficult. And, um, you know, it's important to remember, because I'm not trying to scare you, again, I'm just trying to inform you, that, that very often the things that you're seeing on this slide and this picture, they're not long-term, right? Your kids are going to make it to, to someone that they know, that they trust, that's gonna care for them. But even if it's just a short-term problem, you know, who wants to have their kids experience that when they don't have to? These temporary guardianship papers can eliminate that entirely. Okay, that is the alive but incapacitated summary or background documents foundation. Okay, summarize. We've got power of attorney, medical power of attorney, healthcare directive, minor power of attorney, and minor medical power of attorney. Got it? Good. So now let's move on to the good stuff, I guess. There are really the stuff that everybody thinks about when you think about estate planning, which is, right? What protects you when you die? What are the things that step into your place and make sure that the things that you wanna get done, get done to protect your people, to protect your assets, to make sure your assets go to the right place, to make sure that your assets are used for good and not squandered, to make sure that they are used to provide opportunities for your family? What does that? Let's talk about it. The first one that we talk about is something that everybody knows about, everyone's heard of. This is the last will and testament. The last will and testament does three main things. First, it names a personal representative. The personal representative is the person that is in charge of gathering your debts, gathering your assets, paying off your debts, and distributing your assets. The second thing a will does, which is super, super important if you have kids, is name long-term guardians, right? These are the people that would stand in your place as parents if something happened to you. The third and final thing that a will does is it outlines the distribution of your assets. Essentially, who gets what. Now, who is right for the personal representative? We get this question all the time. Uh, this is very, very similar to your power of attorney, and often the power of attorney and the personal representative are the same person. This person needs to be honest. They need to be responsible. It helps if they know your family because they're gonna be sort of dealing and helping through this grieving process, and they have to be willing to take on the role, right? This ideal person is organized enough to be able to put everything together and figure everything out. That's what's important. Now. If you don't pick a personal representative, who is going to pick for you? Well, the government, right? There's a specific hierarchy of who is the personal representative. It's going to start with the spouse 
and then it's going to go on down from there and can include creditors and can also include essentially anyone that steps up and wants to do it after a certain period of time. Okay. Now, second role we're talking about, long-term guardian, naming long-term guardians. Now, this is probably the thing that gets in, in people's ways the most. This is the thing that steps, steps in the way and prevents people from taking action the most. So we're going to spend a couple of seconds here to think about this. But the person that's right to be your long-term guardian is honest, right? Remember, this is going to be the person that's going to step in and be the parent for your kids if you can't do it. So they're going to be honest. They need to be responsible. And most importantly, that's why it's in all caps, right? They, you want someone that shares your values. You also want someone that's willing to take on the role. This is probably the most important decision that's going to be made in the will if you do things right. And it's also the hardest decision. It's the one that also sort of causes the most conflict amongst spouses. Now, if you don't pick, who picks here? The judge. Okay, the judge is going to pick. What you have to remember is they're going to pick. They're going to try to do the best thing that they can do, but they don't know your family. They don't know what's important to you. They don't know your values. So they're going to be making this decision from a disadvantaged position. And like I said, picking a guardian, choosing a guardian is often the biggest hurdle to estate planning for parents. But I've got a couple things to consider, and these are things I talk about all the time. First things first, your B choice is probably going to be better than a judge's choice. Again, what a judge doesn't know about you and your family are probably the most important factors to consider when it comes to making this choice. Your family values, your values on education, on politics, on religion, on money, on discipline, on everything across the board, right? And I always sort of point out and use this example to, to, this always resonates with people. We all have somebody in our family who looks good on paper, who seems like a great person, who maybe is a great person, but that we would never ever want to raise our kids, right? That is probably the person that the judge is going to pick if they are forced to choose because all they get to see is the surface level information. They don't get to know and have a lot of insight into your beliefs and your values, your philosophies, what you think is important. All right. Now, the other thing to remember when I'm talking to, to parents about this is that often your B choice is better than the judges. And the reason for that is that this is easy to update. Um, I typically suggest that they just sort of agree and make the best decision that they can for right now, even if it's not their ideal number one position, um, um, person, or if they don't have an ideal number one person. Um, pick the person that you have now, and then every year you reflect back, you look, and you can update if you need to. Okay, because remember, this is your child's future at stake. This is the person or the people that are going to be raising your kids if you can't. So it's critically important. It's not something to just wipe under the rug. This is one of those hard decisions that, if made properly and made right, can really have a significant outcome on the future of your family. So it's really important. Okay. All right, the last thing that happens is distribution of assets. Who gets what? Pretty straightforward. You want Johnny to have 100 bucks? He gets 100 bucks. You want Sally to have your, your Van Gogh? She gets the Van Gogh. And then most of the time it's gonna go spouse and then to kids, right? And if, you pay, if you don't pick, if you don't have a will, what happens? What is the consequence? It's pretty straightforward. The government picks again. Typically, this is going to go, oh, I right, have right here. It's called intestate succession. It's going to go spouse, then kids, then parents, then siblings, and on down until basically somebody is in a, a section. So um, if you have a spouse, they get it all. If you have, a, if you have children, they get it all. If you, if, you didn't, if you don't have any spouse or children and you have a parents, they get it all. That's how it goes. All right? It's pretty straightforward, but this can often... Um, lead to some problems because you may not want your your parents to get everything you may not even want your kids to get everything i just did a uh, had a meeting today with a with a with some potential clients who had relatively significant assets and they only wanted half to go to their kids they wanted the other half to go to charity if you don't have a will you are not going to be able to give and do any charitable distributions all that charitable giving will go nowhere it will only go to your family 
just the way that it works. Okay, that's it. Those are the basics. Now, this is the setup that everyone should have no matter what. Like I said, rich or poor, single or married, kids or no kids, this is what you wanna have. The reason for that is it's gonna cover your basis, right? It's gonna cover you if you are alive but incapacitated. It's also gonna cover you when you pass away. It's gonna protect you specifically and individually, and it's also going to protect your family, all right? Now, there is one big limitation to this foundational plan, and I wanted to talk about it here in this presentation because it is a significant factor and a significant thing to think about for many, many people, okay? With a will, any distribution is immediate, okay? What that means is there is no way to provide for long-term oversight of assets. Essentially, if Johnny's getting 100 bucks, when you die, Johnny gets 100 bucks. No one's holding on to that 100 bucks for him. It's just going straight to him, and he's gonna be able to do anything that he wants with it. Now, this can have unintended consequences. For example, if you have kids, you know, if they're under 18, the money will be held for them. When they turn 18, they're getting a check for their share. Right? When they're, if they're 20 and something happens to you, they're getting a the whole thing. Sometimes if they're 30, they're getting a the whole thing. That's not something that you want. Okay. Second example is going to be special needs. If you have a child or, or um, someone that you want to provide for that has special needs and they get government benefits, giving them um, uh, inheritances outright can really affect the eligibility that they have for certain government programs um, and certain government benefits. The solution, it's actually pretty simple. I think many of you have heard of this before. It's the revocable living trust. And although you may have heard of it, you're probably thinking to yourself, what the heck is a trust anyway? The way I always describe a trust is like a box, okay? This is a box that is created for you. While you are alive, you are 100% in charge of the box. You are the maker of the box, you are the breaker of the box, you can throw the box away. You can put anything that you want inside of the box. You can take anything out of the box that you want. And you also get to write the rules for how everything in the box is treated after you are gone, AKA you get to dictate how trust assets are treated for your kids or for any other beneficiaries when you die. You also get to name the next person that's going to step up and manage the trust when you are gone, okay? That is essentially how a trust works. The trustee is essentially the CEO of this box. They are in charge of managing the box and they are in charge of protecting and, and uh, investing the property inside of the box so that it grows and is of benefit to the beneficiaries, which in most cases when you're gone would be your kids, if you have kids. Now, there is one big limitation to this type of trust that many people want and ask for, and that is asset protection. There is no asset protection for this type of trust while you are alive. Now, when you are gone and the trust is for your kids or, or sort of passes down to the benefit of your kids, it becomes a tremendous amount of asset protection, which we'll talk about later, I think. But for you, because you have such extreme flexibility, because you can update and change this trust anytime you want, because you can move anything in or out of the trust anytime you want, because you have this maximum flexibility, it comes at a cost of lack of asset protection. Basically, the government says, if you can do all this stuff, if you can change all these things, we're not gonna protect you from creditors um, in this situation, okay? Now, what do you get though with a revocable living trust? Once you're gone, you get a bunch of cool stuff, okay? You get oversight over the money, right? You have trustee that's in place to make sure that the money is distributed and used for good and not for evil or just wasted. It's probably not gonna be used for evil. Management, right? You have somebody there that, that hopefully is a steady hand, somebody that is knowledgeable enough to um, hire a professional to take care of the assets, to help them grow um, to help keep them safe and protected and to make sure that they get used to their highest and best ability. You've also got an extra layer of security. You know, the, what I always point out to people when they come in is that professional athletes 
you see them going broke all the time. You see them going broke literally all the time. And it's often they're not broke because of frivolous spending or bad habits. They're often broke because they get presented with all of these, these um, quote unquote great business deals that have amazing returns that are actually just shams. And what a trust provides is one extra layer, one extra um, set of eyes on a deal, one extra set of, of hopefully experienced and knowledgeable eyes to be able to say, like, this is not a good opportunity. We, we, I'm not going to allow this to happen because it's too risky. Okay? That's what you get with the trust. You also get the security of knowing your money is benefiting your people the way that you want. The example I always use is, you know, kids go off to college, they, they write a letter to the trustee or send an email to the trustee and they say, hey, I got into Stanford, please pay the tuition. Trustee cuts the check, no problem, right? Then they write them again and they say, excuse me, trustee, um, I am going to be living in a place that doesn't have good transportation and walking is not enough. I need a car. And they say, I would like a Ferrari. The trustee says, I don't think so, but I'll give you a Jeep. Okay, That's the kind of oversight that you get with the trustee so that the beneficiaries have their needs met, but money isn't just wasted on frivolous things. Okay, Now, that's it. That is the gist of it, okay? That is estate planning, foundation. You pretty much know everything that you need to know to make good decisions, okay, for the most part. But, like I said at the beginning, there is one thing missing from this presentation. That one thing is that I haven't been able to tailor it specifically to your needs, to your goals, and to your family dynamics. And I haven't been able to tell you about any of the blind spots there might be because of your specific needs and family situation. To bridge that gap, I want to offer you an opportunity to speak with me for free to formulate a specific strategy for you and your family. I'd be happy to meet with you in person or speak with you over the phone, whichever you prefer. And by the time we're done, you'll have a crystal clear understanding of what options are available to help you protect your family and ensure future generations are given every opportunity to succeed. Because at the end of the day, I don't care what you want to do from an estate planning perspective. I tell people this all the time. I don't care what you do. I don't judge whether it's right or wrong or fair or unfair or anything like that. I don't care. There's only one thing that I do care about. I do care about making sure you are making an informed decision regarding your family. And I welcome the opportunity to help you create whatever plan you decide to implement for your family or not. Now, to set up a time to talk with me, you can just click the button below. It will literally take you to my calendar you just pick a date and time that works for you, and on that date and time, we'll meet, we'll talk about your family, we'll talk a little bit about what you've got going on from an asset uh, perspective, we'll talk about your needs, your goals, your wants, your dreams, your family dynamics, everything that you're um, thinking about and, and or worried about, and I'll give you some options, some ideas, and, and you can decide what you wanna do from there, okay? So, don't wait, just click the button, schedule a session today. Thank you so much, once again, I'm Christopher Small. I look forward to the opportunity to talk to you and um, hope this helped. Bye-bye.